join us online. We are so glad that you are part of our church family today as well. Well, for the last four weeks, we've been talking about this question. How do we stand firm and love well in a culture of compromise? Uh, today, we're wrapping up the series, and we're looking at one of the most famous Bible stories in all of Scripture, the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And uh, this is a great story, and when I was a kid and I heard this story, you know, I had this image in my mind that Daniel must have been like this really strong, buff, 20-year-old guy, probably could have taken on a lion or two himself. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Daniel's actually in his 80s when this takes place. Puts a whole other perspective on it, doesn't it? has nothing to do with his spiritual strength to survive. It's all about, I mean, his physical strength. It's all about his spiritual strength. Now, one of the ways that you may be able to relate to Daniel that you didn't know, throughout his career, Daniel served a series of horrible bosses. Anybody ever have a horrible boss? Maybe you have one now, so you better be careful who's in the room. Uh, but he has, he has served five kings, over the course of his lifetime. Uh, the king in this story is king number four. And these kings held him to almost impossible tasks. He was on call 24-7. Whenever they needed him, if it was in the middle of the night, it didn't matter, he had to, he had to come. And uh, if he, uh, one of the things they asked him to do, for example, was to interpret my dreams. That's, that's a pretty impossible thing for somebody to do. But here he is now, he's 80 years old, still going strong. And I want to just give a little shout out to all of our octogenarians. It doesn't matter how old you are, God still wants to use you. Kayla was 85 years old when he helped take the children of Israel into the promised land. I can give a shout out to my own dad who's 80 years old, almost 81, still serving on staff at Christ Fellowship Church. God's never done using you. Doesn't matter how old you are. So last week, we end up the story with King Belshazzar getting defeated by King Darius. And so today we're moving on with the story. This is chapter 6 in Daniel. If you've got your Bibles, you can follow along there. Otherwise, it'll be on the screen. We're going to cover a lot of Scripture today, but it is an awesome story. So here we go, verse 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. So Darius is a brand new king. He gets to determine how the kingdom is set up. So he says, we're going to have 120 provinces. We might say states. And over each state, there's going to be a satrap, which we would call a governor. And then I'm going to divide all of these states into three regions. I'm going to put a leader over each region. And one of the leaders chosen was Daniel. Now the king didn't know Daniel from Adam. But Daniel had a great reputation. And because of his reputation, he gets placed in this position of responsibility. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So Daniel performs his duties with such excellence that he stands out from all of the other governors and administrators. He didn't just distinguish himself. The text says he so distinguished himself. The results that Daniel produced are so exceptional that when the king is thinking about who do I make the prime minister of this country, the choice is obvious. Daniel is far and away the best choice. So here's the first point I want to make today. Christians are meant to stand out, not blend in. We live in a culture that wants to get us all to blend in, to all conform, to think the same things, to act in the same way. And we want everybody to be alike, to fit into the cultural mode. Culture wants you to be a sheep, following all the other sheep in culture, even if those sheep are headed off a cliff. We feel this pressure, don't we, to conform? Uh, culture says, if you conform, life's going to be easier for you. You won't offend anybody. You won't make your boss mad. You won't get in any fights on social media. Life's going to be much more peaceful if you just get with the rest of the sheep and conform. But Jesus said, you are the light of the world. 
You're meant to stand out, not blend in. Here's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2. He said, you should become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Sounds like our generation, doesn't it? And he says, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. We've been talking in this whole series about standing firm on the truth of God's word. We're meant to influence the culture, not to be influenced by it. We're to be in the world, but not to be of the world. We're to stand out, not to blend in. When, when people look across the landscape of the darkness of our culture, there ought to be millions of lights, Christians, who are shining the light of Christ, not just by what they say they believe, but the way they actually live their life. So Daniel shows us two ways to stand out as Christians. Uh, first of all, we should stand out by always doing our best. Daniel stands out as the best administrator. When the king looks at his region, he sees that their budget has a surplus. He sees that their schools are testing the highest, that they're producing the most jobs. And he sees Daniel performing in such an excellent way, he says he's got to be the prime minister. Now, at this stage of his life, he's an octogenarian. He's well past retirement age. He could have just mailed it in said, hey, I'm just going to do whatever I need to do until they put me out to pasture. But that wasn't his attitude at all, was it? As long as God puts me in this place of influence, I'm going to serve God with everything that I have. And it really reflects a principle that Paul teaches us in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Paul says, so whether you eat or drink, and what he means by that is even in the smallest things of life, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God. When you have the name Christian on the back of your jersey, everything you do reflects on the Lord. And so if we're going to do something, we ought to do it to the best of our ability to bring glory to Him. Um, just give you an example. Early in my teenage years, our family uh, rented a cabin on a lake just to have vacation for the week. And at the end of the week, you know, it's time to, to check out. And a lot of families would just probably leave a big mess behind because there's cleaners, right? They come, they're hired to come in and do all the work. Not my parents. My parents had this philosophy, which they taught us. You always leave a place better than you found it. So they mobilized all of us, split up all the chores. We all pitch in, leave the place, spick and span. Now, if you were one of the cleaners that came and you knew the people renting were Christians, you'd leave with a positive impression about Christians. Now, if you knew they were Christians, you came and it was destroyed, we'd give you a whole different perspective too, right? It's like when you go to a restaurant, if a Christian doesn't tip, it leaves a bad reflection on Jesus Christ. If you pray before your meal, you better tip well. <laughs> so we give God glory. Now, when you excel, it not only brings God glory, but oftentimes it also brings more opportunities to you. And it gives you more opportunities to influence other people. Excellence can, however, be a double-edged sword. Because a lot of times, it'll make other people jealous. And that's what happens in this particular story. All the other guys that get passed over to be prime minister are jealous of Daniel, and so they conspire together to take him down. At this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him. So his colleagues are bitter, and they start digging for dirt. So they're going through all of his old emails, all of his text messages, all of his posts on social media, trying to see if he did anything wrong. They're, they're interviewing all of his employees. Did he ever mistreat you? Were there any Me Too moments? What happened? How did he lead you? And they're trying to dig up any dirt. They're looking at all the contracts that he signed. Man, did he, did he hand out any favors to people? We know how these contracts work, right? Surely, surely there was some, something shady going on somewhere. I mean, this is politics. They couldn't find anything. This is their conclusion. He was trustworthy and neither corrupt 
nor negligent. He did his job to the best of his ability and he was upright as he did it. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they turn over every rock they can and they don't find a thing to use against him. This is the second way that we should stand out as Christians in our culture. We stand out by always doing what's right. These men had placed a target on Daniel's back but they couldn't find any ammo. They, they didn't have anything to shoot against him because he'd always done what was right. Solomon wrote, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Integrity is kind of like a Teflon shield in our life. If you've ever cooked with Teflon, you know, it's the non-stick stuff. When you live with integrity, people can sling mud at you, but it won't stick because of that life of integrity. Uh, since there was no scandal to get him on, this, this is what they decide. The only way we can get him is to find something we can do related to his religious beliefs. So, these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king, and they said, may King Darius live forever. So right away, they're going to butter up the king. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. So they're appealing to the king's ego to set a law to outlaw prayer to anybody except him. Now your majesty issue the decree, put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. They know once they get this bill signed, it's going to happen. So King Darius put the decree in writing. So that outlaws prayer. Anytime a government makes a law that outlaws prayer, the handwriting is on the wall. And we have seen this firsthand in our own nation as our government has increasingly pushed God and prayer out of public life, the morality of our country has taken a nosedive. These men uh, trick the king. They say, hey, we've all gotten together and we say, this is a good idea. They just fail to mention that they hadn't talked to the prime minister. They hadn't talked to his right-hand man. He hadn't signed off on it. The king assumes that he did, and so he, he signs the bill. Everybody agrees, I should, I should do this. This is the popular thing to do, and he doesn't realize in that moment that he's literally signing Daniel's death warrant. Daniel hears about the new law, and you know what he did? He packed up all his stuff, and he moved to Canada. Some of you have been tempted to do that, haven't you? No. no, no, no. <laughs> and, and you're not supposed to. No matter how bad it gets in our country, you've been placed here to be a light to this nation. Here's what happens next. When Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem, so they're wide open, three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. And then these men went as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So Daniel knows, if I pray to God, I face the death penalty. And what does he do? He goes home, makes sure the windows are open, everybody can see, he gets down on his knees and he prays to God just as he had done before the law was made. Didn't he realize that all of his enemies were going to be staking out uh, his house across the street, seeing what he's going to do? Yeah, he absolutely knew that. But he teaches us a powerful lesson for how we can respond when we're being attacked. Here's the second thing today. When you're under attack, keep calm and carry on. You don't have to be bullied or intimidated to compromise. That's what culture's trying to do, right? It feels like it, doesn't it? They want us to conform, and they're putting pressure on us to intimidate Christians to conform to the standards of this world. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be bullied. 
My last name is Bray. That's what donkeys do. Donkeys are pretty stubborn. When you're under attack, you keep calm and carry on. A lot of people, when they're under pressure, there's two common responses. One is fight. We get mean, we get ugly, we go after people, we want to take down them, accuse them. The other side is flight. People want to run away. Daniel doesn't do either one. He stands firm, but he does it in a very peaceful way. This is who I am. I'm not changing. I'm not submitting. I'm not yielding. But he's not angry or ugly towards anybody else. He stays calm, and he carries on. And he shows us here that when the pressure's on, here's what you need to do. You got to double down on your prayer life. You got to double down on your prayer life. Remember, Daniel's the prime minister. He's one of the busiest people in the whole nation. He shouldn't have time to pray. But prayer is the cornerstone of his life. He, he's not too busy to pray. He's, he's so busy he has to pray because he needs God's help with everything that he's doing. For him, prayer is his lifeline. It's where he finds strength, renewal, courage. I mean, he's in this cutthroat business of Babylonian politics where in a heartbeat, they'll throw you in a fiery furnace. They'll throw you in a lion's den. Where are you gonna have the courage to stand up and be a man of faith in the midst of that environment? It's through prayer. The way you stand up against culture is to bow down in prayer. Daniel models this so well for us. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if your personal prayer life was put on public display? If all of your neighbors had a window into your prayer life? Some of us wouldn't feel so good, would we? The average American, uh, they say only 20% pray on a daily basis. For a lot of people, there wouldn't be anything to see. But Daniel says, hey, here's the windows wide open. Watch me. He faithfully followed the Jewish practice, which was to pray morning, afternoon, and evening, three times a day. But it wasn't just a religious exercise for him. This was his lifeline to God. This is the source of courageous faith in your life and if you're working among non-christian people you better be prayed up if you're going into your annual review with a non-christian boss you better be prayed up if you're going to negotiate a deal with somebody who's not a believer you better be prayed up if you're a teacher you get called into the principal's office be prayed up in your family If if they are anti-Christian, when you go to those family gatherings, you better be prayed up. Prayer is what gets us centered. It's where we find the strength and the courage to keep calm and carry on no matter what is happening all around us. Daniel also teaches us as, as we pray that we persevere with hope. Hope changes how we handle every circumstance, doesn't it? College football season just started. Hope springs eternal for every team, right? And we're watching the games. We want our team to win. I mean, I root for Indiana. For us, it was a moral victory to only lose by 20 points to Ohio State. (laughs) But we persevere with hope that it'll be better. But we have a hope that is founded on Jesus Christ. What does Daniel do? Do you see when he goes to pray? He prays in front of this window that opens toward Jerusalem. Why does it tell us that? Is there like, did did we miss a memo that somehow as Christians we're supposed to pray to Jerusalem like Muslims pray to Mecca? I haven't seen that in the Bible. The Bible says we're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but it doesn't say we have to pray toward Jerusalem. So why in the world does it mention that this window is facing toward Jerusalem? I think we have to keep in mind that Daniel's not only the prime minister, but he's a prophet. And as a prophet, he foresees the future. And as he prays, this window reminds him that there's going to come a day when God redeems Israel and restores them back to their homeland. He's taking us back home. And whenever we pray, we pray with one eye fixed on heaven. That someday, after we get through all of this stuff, God's going to take us home so we can persevere through whatever we face in this world because he's taken us 
home. Here's what the writer to Hebrews said of Hebrews uh, 10.23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 13. Then they said to the king, Daniel pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. So they did their stakeout. They saw him dig down and pray, and they run back to the king, and they say, Daniel's still praying. Daniel's still praying. <laughs> Grow up. When the king heard this, he's greatly distressed. Why? Because he realized all of a sudden he got played. These guys weren't out to honor him. They were really out to get Daniel. So he is distraught because he knows what this means for Daniel. Daniel's his right-hand man. He's his good friend. And he's determined to rescue Daniel. And he made every effort to until sundown to save him. And then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Time's up. Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually, rescue you. I know you got a God that you pray to. I don't believe in him, but I hope he rescues you. And then a stone is brought, placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever noticed that before? That they rolled a stone over the den and they sealed it. Remind you of anybody? Jesus, right? Jesus gets placed in the tomb, they roll the stone over, and they seal it so nobody can touch Jesus. Well, that's good news for Daniel because we know how the story with Jesus turned out, right? Well, the king, he's so upset. He can't eat, he can't sleep all night long. He's worried about Daniel. And I would imagine Daniel didn't get a lot of sleep that night either. Uh, but I have a picture of what his night might have looked like. Uh, somebody painted this thing, and I, I think this is just an awesome picture of what might have happened that night. I love this because Daniel's back is to the lions. He's focused on God. His confidence and his trust is in God. He knows that God can rescue him from the mouths of lions. So he turns his back to these great big kitty cats. And I think it's also a great picture for us as we're going through life, you may have your own critics, your own lions that are circling you, gnarling at you, baring their teeth, growling. You just stand firm, calmly, with your confidence in God. Keep calm and carry on. Now, the story has an incredibly happy ending. God saves Daniel. And, oh, I should, read the t I should read the text. I skipped the text. Uh, verse 19 at the first light of dawn the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den when he came near the den he called to Daniel in an anguished voice Daniel servant of the living God has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions he didn't expect anybody to answer Daniel answered may the king live forever my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions there wasn't just another in the fire there was another in the lion's den encouragement for us right as we're going through the things of life God's angels are in our midst amen? amen and he says they have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight nor have I ever done any wrong before you your majesty and the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den and when Daniel was lifted from the den no wound was found on him Sounds kind of like the guys that were brought out of the fire, right? And there was no, not even a smell of smoke that was found on them. No, some of you have little cats. You get scratched. You got scratches all over you from those little kitty cats. Where are my cat owners at? We got, we got a few of you, right? These are big cats, and he doesn't even have a scratch on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and this is kind of the gruesome part. This is the PG-13 part. It just shows how brutal they were in that day. They're thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. 
Then King Darius wrote to all the nations. He wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Talk about influencing culture. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. There is an incredible happy ending to this story because not only is Daniel rescued but he gets to serve the next king and it's during the reign of Cyrus that guess what happens the Israelites get to go home God answers their prayers takes them back to Jerusalem the story has an incredibly happy ending but you know whenever we read a text we also have to understand it in light of the entirety of of scripture and we know from a lot of other texts that there isn't always that happy ending that sometimes there's deliverance on earth but sometimes that deliverance doesn't come until we're in heaven here's the third lesson I want to give you today just to give perspective to this God sometimes rescues but he always resurrects we love the story of Daniel because he gets saved but that doesn't always Happen, and I want to give you just kind of a sobering truth. You may need to be prepared to suffer for Jesus. Amen. Unless there is revival in our country, it's going to become increasingly anti Christian. And we've seen what that looks like in other parts of the world. Many other Christians face persecution on a daily basis, they get arrested, they are beaten. They're thrown into prison. Sometimes they even die. There may come a time where I'm told I've got to compromise what I preach or I'm going to jail. Thank goodness I got a good example in Paul. He wrote half the New Testament in jail because he wasn't afraid to preach what God told him to preach. We may be persecuted for our faith at some point. I hope it doesn't happen in our lifetime, but we've seen the decline happen a lot more rapidly than any of us expected. Even now, we face some persecution. It's pretty mild. But some of you get treated differently by your family because they don't believe what you believe. They don't really want you at family gatherings because you're different. Some of you, it's that way at work. People know what you believe and and maybe you get left out of a project or you don't get invited to a social event or maybe even get passed over for a promotion. It, It can have an impact. Sometimes there is persecution because of what we believe. There may even be somebody that knows what you believe and they put a target on your back just like the guys do in this story because they want to bring you down based on what you believe. Here's what Peter said. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what's right, you'll be blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened for it is better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Even when you suffer, there's good news. When you trust God with your future, it will always end well. Because even if he doesn't rescue, he will resurrect. When we read Hebrews chapter 11, it's the great chapter about men and women of faith. And we read all of these incredible stories of how God rescued this person and that person. And and you get all pumped up as you read it. And then there's three little verses that are tucked into that chapter that kind of suck all the air out of the chapter because you realize there's another side to the story not everybody gets rescued this is verse 35 through 38 they didn't teach you these verses in Sunday school there were others who were tortured refusing to be released so they said you can be let go if you'll compromise your beliefs they refused to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment they were put to death by stoning they were sawed in two they were killed by the sword maybe these are why you didn't learn it in Sunday school kind of graphic uh, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins destitute, persecuted and mistreated 
The world was not worthy of them. Sometimes our deliverance happens in this world and sometimes it happens in the next. But if we'll be faithful to Jesus Christ, he promises us a resurrection. And these people are blessed in that they have a greater reward waiting for them in heaven because they were faithful through their persecution. The world was not worthy of them. Jesus, our own Savior, was persecuted. He was put on a cross. He was killed, placed in a tomb. But three days later, he was raised from the dead. And it's because of his resurrection that we have the hope of having that same resurrection in our own lives as well. Because here's the deal. There are a lot of lions in this world that the enemy uses, and he might win a skirmish or two, but here's the good news of Scripture. The Lion of Judah, Amen. Jesus Christ, has your back. And I've read to the end of the book, and I know who wins the war. And there will be a resurrection for everybody who puts their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. It always ends well when you trust the Lion of Judah. Now, I want to I bring this home we got to make every message personal, apply the truth to our own life. So I want to just give you a few questions. The first one has to do with the integrity of your life. Here's the first question. Are there any areas in my life where I need to choose integrity over compromise? Is there any area in my work practices where I'm compromising? Anywhere in my personal finances where I'm compromising? Anywhere in my relationships with other people? Any, anywhere in that part of my life that nobody else sees? where I'm compromising and I need to choose integrity instead. We can stand out in a dark world when we choose integrity. Second question, do I need to be more consistent in my spiritual practices? If the world had a window into your prayer life, what would they see? What would they see like Daniel that you have a set place, you have a set time and there's nothing that interferes? I mean, I'm telling you, this is one part that really spoke to me this week because there's some times where, you know, I'm pretty busy as a pastor. I gotta go to the hospital. I gotta do this. And sometimes, you know, you, you, I'll do it later. No, no, no. You gotta, you gotta work everything else around your prayer time. Amen. That's gotta be the most important thing. Lastly, how might God want me to be more courageous with my faith? When you're at work or a restaurant, do you still bow your head and pray for your meal? When you're with people that have different beliefs than you do, do you still hold to your principles and your convictions? Do you have the courage to invite somebody to church? That can make all the difference. One invitation can change somebody's life. Guys, we are called to influence the culture. We are to be bright lights in a dark world. And the best way to do that is by standing firm and loving well. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you're here today, and it is the desire of your heart to be a light for Christ in the darkness of this world, to even when the pressure comes on, stand up for Jesus. I want to invite you right now just to stand up where you right, are right now just as a declaration of your faith and confidence in God and say, I want to be a light in this world. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to compromise by beliefs, but I'm going to have a, be a person who perseveres for Jesus Christ in whatever I'm facing. If that's the, the expression of your heart today, would you just stand and say, Lord, I want to be that person. In this community, in my neighborhood, in my workplace, in my family. I want to be the light that points people to Jesus Christ. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We know we're not perfect. We know we're still a work in progress, but we come before you asking you to complete the work that you've begun in us, asking you to help us to shine even brighter to the people who are around us. We pray for those that don't know you, that, are, that live near us. They're, they may be next door. They may be in the cubicle or the office next to us. They may be down the street. They may be in, a, in our family. God, we lift them up to you today. We pray, God, that you would help them to see the light of Christ, whether it's through us or through somebody else. We want to make a difference for you in this world, God. We want to stand out. We don't want to blend in 
because Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. We got to point people to Jesus. And so God, I just pray that you would affirm that in us, deep in the core of our being, that no matter what pressure we feel, that we're going to rise up like Daniel, that we're going to keep calm, we're going to carry on, we're going to be people of faith. Father God, I pray for those, maybe right now, in their workplace, they feel the pressure. In their family, they feel the pressure. God, I pray you'd renew them and strengthen them on the inside so they can be people of faith. God, we love you. We want to bring honor and glory to your name in everything that we do and say. And we pray this and we declare this in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. You can be seated. Well, thank you for being part of our worship here today at the Grace Place. Uh, We're so glad to have you with our church family. Maybe this is your first time with us, and I just want to say welcome at the end of the service. If you would, stop by our guest services area, which is the glass-enclosed area out in the lobby. We'd love to give you a gift and say thank you uh, for being here today. I want to just share a couple cool stories with you if I can. Uh, Each and every week we like to highlight our our partner ministry, our community table which feeds hungry people in our community. Yesterday they fed 1,252 people. And they were telling me before the service how it's been really cool. There's one woman that was suicidal when they started helping her. And she just was so blessed by this, so ministered to by the team. And now, she has a place to live. Now, uh, she is helping to be an advocate for our community table. She has a job. I mean, it's just an, an incredible turnaround story because this ministry has been loving people in need. So um, I just celebrate that and just such a cool story of how God is at work. Uh, I'll tell you one other story. Uh, we had uh, a lady in our Discover Grace class uh, this past week and uh, she was saying as she's been driving down the street, God's been tugging on her heart to turn left and go to the Grace place. Instead, she was turning Right until it kept happening and she said I'm going to turn left and uh, God's blessed her and I won't call her out but she's here today we're so glad the Lord is working in so many ways drawing people to the grace place and uh, yeah Uh, every week you get a connection card in your bulletin we encourage you to fill that out you can place that in the offering bucket when it comes by here in a moment If you've made any spiritual commitments, you can put that on there. Any prayer requests, put that on there. Please share those things with us. Uh, We do want to continue in our worship now with the giving of our tithes and offerings, so I want to invite the ushers to come forward. This is a great way for us to worship the Lord, to let him know that he's first place in our life, and to be partners in what God is doing here in Stewart and across the Treasure Coast through the Grace Place. Uh, We do have many ways that you can give. We have kiosks out in the lobby. You can give online at thegraceplace.com. So thank you for being a partner in helping us make a difference in this community. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of things as well. Uh, Next weekend is Grandparents Day. And being a proud grandparent, I'm excited about it. Uh, also excited, we, got, we finally got the green light last Sunday afternoon to be able to share that we're going to be grandparents for a second time. So yeah, our, our daughter in Ohio uh, is, is going to have a little girl in February. So we're super excited to have a grandson and a granddaughter on the way. Uh, so we're looking forward to next week because we're proud grandparents. Most of us are. So you're going to have photo opportunities. There's going to be some, some neat things next week. So we want to honor you. If you're a grandparent, come with your grandkids. If you know grandparents, invite them to come out with their ki- grandkids next weekend. And we're also kicking off a brand new series next weekend called The Power to Change. And I don't know if you know anybody who's wanted to change and tried to change, but just hasn't been able to change. The biggest reason is they haven't tapped into the power to change. And I believe this is going to be a life-changing series for some people. So at the end of the service, as you head out of here, we've got some people that, that have these cards in a basket. Here's my challenge. Would you take two of these cards, pray, and say, God, who should I give these to? and invite them to come back with you next weekend to the Grace Place. Here's what it says on the back of the card. It says, no one's perfect. We all need God's grace. 
and anyone can change with God's help. You're invited to join me this Sunday at 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. So you tell them which service you're going to be at. You meet them in the lobby, sit with them, encourage them. Uh, this could be a life-changing series for somebody. So please take these, pray about who you can give them to and invite them to come. Also, one other thing that could be life-changing, uh, September 13th, which is a Wednesday night, we're starting our new uh, round of campus studies. Smaller groups where we get into God's word, we learn principles that we can apply to our life. Uh, we've got a group for marriage. We've got a group for parents. Uh, we've got various Bible studies that you can be part of. And guys, I wanted to speak to you for a moment and just kind of challenge you. We've had a tremendous response from our ladies to, Bible, to, to come to Bible study. Not so much from the guys. Guys, we've got to step up. We're called to be spiritual leaders. So I'm challenging you to get into, we've got two groups. Uh, we've got our, our regular men's Bible study that meets every Wednesday that's kicking off a new study that night. And then I'm gonna be leading a, a group called The Measure of a Man. We're gonna be going through 21 qualities of spiritual maturity. You say, hey, it's, it's time for me to get deeply rooted in the Christian faith. I gotta grow in my faith. I want to challenge you to be part of that group. You can sign up out in the lobby. We've got a table with the different groups there. Stop by, pick one, join us September 13th. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up our service with one last worship song. So our team's going to come and lead us. At the end of that, uh, we want to encourage you, if you have a prayer need, to come down to this side of the platform. If you'd like to receive communion, you can come down to this side. And as the team is coming, I want to uh, introduce you to Maya Gill. She is our brand new director of worship. So we're excited to have her. And her birthday is tomorrow. So happy birthday. Uh, we're so glad to have you. And uh, some of you may not know, but we've really been in a transition for about three months now. So I just want to say thank you to the team. Uh, Ish here somewhere doing such a fantastic job. We finally gave him a week off. Uh, and uh, so we're so glad appreciate all of you guys hey would you stand now let's lift our hearts in worship to the king there is no fear cause I believe there is no doubt I have seen your faithfulness, my fortress, over and over. I have a hope found in your name. I have a strength found in your grace. Your faithfulness, my Over and over Make way through the wall Let's sing it out. God of his 
Everyone have a fat, fantastic weekend. Enjoy your Monday holiday and go in peace and serve the Lord. <laughs>